Hello and welcome back to yet another video in the Nirvana sort of discography, studio albums, retrospective, whatever you want to call this. Anyway, today we are stepping back in time two years from Nevermind to talk about the very first Nirvana album, Bleach, from 1989. I'm told that some editions of this album have a large, the first Nirvana album sticker on the front, but mine, mine doesn't. I... It, I don't know. Anyway, this is a very different record, uh, and actually the first two times I tried to record this intro, I had to just junk it entirely because I wound up being a little bit more negative than I had intended to be, which I think reflects the fact that this is one of those debut albums that is hard to go back to when you've heard the first two. And what I mean by that is not that it's a bad record. Uh, no, in fact, it's a pretty good record, and it's a very enlightening record in terms of sort of what Nirvana were, where they came from, and in a way, it's a more authentic Nirvana than Nevermind. But it's also not as good and not as interesting because they haven't found their thing yet. They haven't become, as I put it in that first video, the Pixies 2 yet. They haven't learned the quiet loud thing. The Beatles haven't yet really seeped into the songwriting, at least not for the most part. So what you get is a series of very sort of lumpy, dirge-like, late 80s grunge. If I remember correctly, Cobain even said at some point later on that they were trying to do stuff that sounded like what was going on in the Pacific Northwest grunge scene at the time. And so maybe for that reason, this is a, it's, it's a very different album. It's very bleak relatively one note musically. As I said, not a bad album. I would characterize this as a better than average, but probably not outstanding late 80s Pacific Northwest grunge album. The other big thing that has to be noted on this album is that the drummer is different. You have Chad Channing as opposed to Dave Grohl. And Chad Channing, well, I'm actually gonna go back and use an example from the Genesis albums I just covered. It's a little bit like the drummer on Trespass, who is a perfectly serviceable drummer. He does a relatively good job, but he's not Phil Collins. And with Chad Channing, it's very similar. He's a good drummer on this album. I would say he does a good job and he fits these songs, but he's not Dave Grohl and he doesn't add that spark that he does on Nirvana songs. I've never actually seriously investigated what Nirvana were like live. And maybe that's a mistake, but so I will be very interested to know what these songs, or at least the ones that persisted in their live set, would sound like with Dave Grohl on drums. Anyway, that was slightly inadequate, but you know what? I've recorded this thing three times, so I'm not gonna record it again. Let's talk about the songs. So the album opens up with a great bass riff headed into a song that I don't really think is about anything, to be honest with you, but that nonetheless sounds very good. And, you know, actually, originally, I thought there that was going to be my commentary on almost all the songs on this album. But uh, as we'll get to very, very soon, a lot of the lyrics on this album seem to be better thought out than the ones on Nevermind, which is interesting because from what I've read, that was apparently not an opinion Kurt Cobain agreed with. He apparently felt that those lyrics were more meaningful and that they were about uh, deeper and more profound things, which is interesting to me because um, I went through them and the impression I got is that a lot of the ones on Nevermind were just kind of nonsense, but yeah, anyway, I'm sure the Nirvana fans will be upset with me for that. So track two has this stop-start, almost jock jams-esque drum pattern that's really good, you know, heavy riff. Uh, lyrics I had never paid attention to. I've known this album for years. Uh, it actually, was actually the first Nirvana album I listened to in full. Probably not the best idea. I was, I was, being, I was being kind of a hipster at the time. Anyway, these lyrics are horrific. It's about the narrator being um, murdered, and other things I can't say, lest the YouTube algorithm bury this video even more than it already will, by characters from The Andy Griffith Show. 
I really like about a girl. It's softer and one of the more forward-looking tracks on this album. It really feels like something that could have been a deep cut on Nevermind or In Utero. It doesn't have the dynamic shifts that you find in a lot of the songs on those two albums, but it is better thought out and the lyrics seem to be more tangibly about the kind of thing that Kurt wrote about on those next two albums than a lot of the stuff that's on here. It's good stuff. I like it. School is simplistic, angry, aggressive punk rock with very minimalist lyrics, which I had always assumed were sort of the an expression of, you know, repressed teenaged angst deferred into one's 20s, you know, that sort of thing that you, you get a lot in uh, punk rock, especially uh, the punk rock starting in this era moving forward. But apparently this is a little bit deeper and or more direct than that. Depending on who one talks to, this is either about the disillusionment of the Seattle grunge scene or, in fact, the fact that Kurt Cobain dropped out of high school and then got a job as a janitor at that same high school. This is a cover of a 1969 track from the Dutch band Shocking Blue. And it's a great cover. Something I've always liked about Nirvana is that a lot of Kurt Cobain's guitar work, especially when he did solos, has this slight late 60s psychedelic inflection that doesn't really come across in a psychedelic sense because Nirvana weren't really about that, but nonetheless has some of the quality that one finds in guitar work from musicians of that period. Especially around like 67, 68, 69. I like this too, although maybe not as much. It's a dirgy, doomy, almost Black Sabbath-y in some ways track. Apparently about a ripped from the headlines story of children being abused and held captive. Probably the weirdest and most out there thing on this album in a lot of ways. And it's something that I remember liking a lot when I first listened to this album. But on this repeated listen, having gone through the rest of Nirvana's catalog, I'm not sure I like it as much. I do enjoy it, but I'm not sure I put it on quite the same level that I initially did. This track is another very straight ahead aggressive punk number. Naturally, it reminds me a lot of the short punk songs on Nevermind, but it is much heavier and a little bit more aggressive than most of those, even if it never quite attains the same vaguely unhinged quality. This track is interesting because it simultaneously embodies a lot of what this album is about, you know heavy, bleak, aggressive, dirgy type tracks, while simultaneously being just a little bit more involved than that, and pointing forward to the evolving songwriting that will be featured on the next album. In particular, the elevation from the droning, grim verse to the equally grim but slightly different and catchy kill a million etc refrain. Lyrically it seems to be primarily about Kurt Cobain's upbringing and sp more specifically his troubled relationship with both of his parents and substance abuse problems specifically with alcohol. It it's another one that like I said I listened to this for years never really picked up on what it was supposed to be about um, because I have a tendency to listen to Kurt Cobain lyrics kind of the way if you're a Yes fan, you listen to John Anderson lyrics. Um, sometimes there's something interesting or profound there, but most of the time it's just some nonsense that complements the song. Uh, and may maybe that was a mistake. We'll see. When we get to In Utero, I'll, I'll decide. With I like this track too, although it's another one I don't remember as much when the album's done. Great riff, good driving, aggressive, propulsive wherever the end of that sentence was going. Um, apparently, it's about Kurt Cobain's disillusion with the kind of lower middle class and working class white American masculinity he grew up with in the area around Aberdeen, Washington. Although, uh, have I not read that, I'm not at all sure that I would have guessed it from the lyrics. Nirvana always had very good closing tracks, and this is no exception. I recognize that it is perhaps a bit silly to say that a band has good closing tracks when said band only has three albums, but, you know, 
I think it's something that's worth praising regardless. Uh, and by closing track, I am of course referring to the fact that the original 1989 release of this album ends here. Uh, the CD that I and most of you who own a physical version of this album probably have is not that way. It has two more tracks and we will be talking about them, but nonetheless, I felt that we should acknowledge the fact that the album originally ended here. And it's a good track. I think there's some general sort of societal disillusionment going on in the lyrics, specifically with the educational system and organized religion. This is a really good, memorable track. I'm glad that they attached it to this album on later re-releases because it's always been one of my favorites. Lyrically, it's apparently about the band's disillusionment and displeasure with Sub Pop and the management of the label. Uh, who were apparently quite critical of the band's music during this period. And indeed, this would turn out to be the only thing they ever recorded for Sub Pop. Not something I think I would have ever read into this myself, but it is apparently, from multiple sources, what this song is about. So, you know, we're going with it. That's what I'm going to tell you. Anyway, I like it. It has a great riff. I like the chorus bit. You know, what more can you ask for? And so we end the version of the album that most people own today with Downer, a short, aggressive punk track featuring Dale Kroger of the Melvins on drums. He's also on a couple of other tracks on this album, something I forgot to mention, but if there's a track on this album where the drumming sounds just a little bit better than the rest of the record, it's probably him. Anyway, very angry track, much like almost everything else on the album. Lyrics extremely critical of contemporary conservative suburban American life. And yeah, it's good. I guess it's a fairly early song that actually predates Nirvana as a band. And from what I understand, Cobain was pretty down on the track later on. But it's good. Bleach is a good album. It's kind of a typical debut of a band who haven't quite found their footing yet, in that it is kind of tentative. It's a little bit one note, which apparently has a little bit to do with label pressures they were feeling at the time. They apparently felt that they needed to conform to a sort of stereotypical notion of what the Seattle grunge scene was in the late 80s. It's a good listen. It's not an album that I want to be especially down on. So if I seem like I've been a little bit negative or unenthused in this review, it's not actually that I dislike this album. It's that when I was doing this series, when I was listening to these three Nirvana albums, I really got into Nevermind and In Utero, way more so than honestly I'd ever been before. Uh, because when I was into Nirvana before, I think I did a review of this album for this channel in like 2015, I think, maybe 2014, something like that. It was relatively early, not a very good video. Uh, it, I can't remember whether I deleted it or YouTube took it down, but it's been down for ages. Anyway, back when I used to actually really underrate Nevermind, and my take was always, you know, Bleach and In Utero, those are the real Nirvana albums. You know, Nevermind, that's, you know, it's commercial, it's, you know, it's this and that. But when I went back and listened to all these albums for this project, I was, I really swayed by Nevermind in a way that uh, I was not before. And, you know, In Utero, of course, still stands up. Uh, when I get to it, I'll, of course, discuss this. It's still my favorite Nirvana album. But this album, it suffers a little bit for comparison. You know, the songwriting is not on the same level. And I think it's perhaps going for a slightly different feel, you know? There's, there's a lot of 60s songwriting in Nevermind and In Utero. There's a lot of, like, the Beatles. And even a little bit of that psychedelic guitar work that I mentioned before, even if it's engaged in a more noise rock context than anything from the 60s. But this is way more hardcore punk. It's doomier, you know? It's... The elements are all good. It's a good album. I enjoy it. I would recommend it. Maybe don't make it your first Nirvana album, but I would recommend it. But it is definitely the weakest of their three studio albums. Anyway, that review probably didn't turn out as well as I wanted it to, but you know, who knows? I never really know how any of these things are going to fit together until I actually assemble all the video files and do the editing, so who knows? Maybe people will like it. Anyway, I do not actually know what my future plans are for the channel. There will be videos up in the next two weeks. I have not decided what they will be about yet. I say something like this every time I do one of these. But anyway, until that time, I will see you all later.